And thank you for joining us today, the latest Retirement Genius Brainstorm webinar. I'm Chris Arrestis, president of Retirement Genius. I want to thank you so much. Today, we're going to talk about myths and realities about retirement. And we are going to look at statistics and we are going to look at studies. We've been crunching the numbers to really get our arms around how unprepared are Americans. And then we're going to talk a bit about what we can do about it, what's going on out there, the, the myths that people are living by, but the realities that the numbers are telling us, how bad's the situation and what is it that people can do about it? And particularly those of you joining us today, how you can use this information to do more to help your clients and, and grow your business. Retirement Genius is an information and resource hub to help people achieve a well-balanced retirement. We focus on giving people information and then pointing them towards the best resources to take on their goals when it comes to their financial planning, health and long-term care security, and their lifestyle. Our belief is you need to bring these three things together to create the well-balanced retirement that people want and people deserve. So let's start out by looking at some of the current events that are impacting the country and having an impact on seniors and retirement. First and foremost, two years now of COVID as it's come, it's gone, it's up, it's down, but it has not gone away. And estimates are at this point, it's cost our economy over $12 trillion. We've had almost 80 We've had 80.3 million people infected, 985,000 people have died from COVID-related conditions. This has been a huge shift in employment patterns, which has had an impact across our economy. And we've seen where COVID has kicked off supply chain disruptions and an inflation spike. Just yesterday, the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Department uh, Treasury released the latest CPI numbers, 8.5% rate of inflation based on the consumer price index. This is the highest it's been in 40 years, since 1981. The, Fed, the Federal Reserve's already approved a quarter percent rate hike, and this is the first time we've seen a rate hike since December of 2018. And the Fed has indicated more rate hikes are going to happen over the remaining meetings, there'll be six more uh, Federal Reserve Board meetings in 2022, and they are targeting getting uh, interest rates up from where it currently stands to 1.9% before year's end. Another major and recent current event that's impacting the whole world and, and the United States is the Ukraine war. This has had further impact spiking inflation with, with how it's hit fuel costs, we're all seeing it at the gas pumps, food costs, we're all seeing it at the grocery store and continuing supply chain disruptions. And uh, as far as anybody can tell at this point, there's really no end to this war in sight. This is something that could go on for months and some are predicting even years before that conflict is resolved. So let's take a look uh, and start to paint a picture of the current population of the United States. Let's, start, let's look at some demographic information and get ourselves level set on where the U.S. is today. First of all, the, the most recent census numbers shows the U.S. has a population of over 330 million people. Of, of that population, age 65 and above, we have 59, 55 million people, which makes up 16.9% of the population. And by 2030, that percent of the population is going to grow to 21% to 73 million Americans, 65 and above. Life expectancy, current life expectancy in the United States, as uh, most currently measured, is 76.6 years. And that's come down. Two years ago, that was 78.9 years. Uh, we've seen life expectancy in the U.S. declining. Uh, the average life expectancy as of today for a male is 75.1 years. For a female, it's 81.2 years. So 
with a decreasing life expectancy uh, in the United States, uh, still a 65 year old today, male, 35% chance they'll reach age 90 and a 46% chance for females that they'll reach age 90. As of 2025, in less than three years, two, about two and a half years from now, the first of the baby boomers start turning 80. So I know we've all talked about how the baby boomers started turning 65 at a rate of 10,000 baby boomers a day. Uh, that, that, that goes back a while now. We're getting to the point where now we have baby boomers who are turning 75, uh, have been turning 75 at about a, an equal pace to when they started turning 65. And we're about to hit a real milestone when, they, when baby boomers start turning 80. Here's some financial demographics to take a look at. The average income in the United States for a 40 hour work week worker is $53,490. The average income for somebody who's 65 and above, $38,515. And the average net worth of somebody 65 and above in the United States today is $170,516. So across uh, the American population, the average amount of money in retirement accounts stands right now at about $65,000. That's not enough to get somebody through one year of retirement, uh, or, or, or certainly not two years of retirement. But the good news is for people that are age 55 to 65, that number is significantly higher. It's $135,000. Now, that's still way below what somebody needs to retire on, but at least they, at that age group, there's a much higher amount than what the national average is, and certainly a much higher amount for younger workers, 35 and under, at just $13,000 in retirement accounts. But this is pointing to very clearly, people are under, underfunded for retirement. If the goal is to replace 70% of your pre-retirement income, then somebody at age 35 who starts saving needs to be saving 24% of their income. If you don't start saving to replace your, your, your pre-retirement income in retirement until age 45, to hit the numbers on a national average, you'd need to be saving 44% of your income, which would be virtually impossible to do. For many people, the, the, the guideline is consider your peak income and multiply that by 10. You would need to have that in savings to maintain your current lifestyle over your entire retirement remaining years. Unfortunately, people are dipping into their accounts, even though they are underfunded, people are even dipping into these retirement accounts way too early. 46% of workers between the ages of 40 and 49 have taken money out of their retirement accounts prematurely, subjecting them to tax penalties and income taxes. So there's a lot of pressure on retirement savings. 30% of people age 55 or older have less than $50,000 saved. 55% of just people across the United States have less than $10,000 saved. 33% of people have absolutely nothing saved for retirement. And this is starting to create a, a, a dynamic in, the, in this country known as the sandwich generation. 79% of parents are continuing to support their adult children financially. 16% of adult children have their parents living with them and they're supporting them. So this cross-generational need to be supporting parents and, 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 and adult children is putting a lot of pressure on people's ability to save for retirement. And this is pushing a lot of people to need to keep working beyond retirement age. Let's assume retirement age is 65. Well, about half of people that are on social security, this is the majority of the income they're living on, which forces many of them to continue to keep working because they didn't adequately save and they over, over relied on social security. 74% of people who, who are surveyed say they plan to continue working during retirement. 46% of people think they're gonna be working part-time past the age of 70. 18% expect to be working full-time 
past the age of 70, and 12% just said they expect that they are going to need to continue working their entire lives, regardless of retirement. So retirement savings, it's just they're not keeping pace. We have about a 13.7% personal savings rate in this country. Now, the average that's spent on living expenses for somebody aged 65 to 74 is $55,000. And the average household retirement income is about the exact same thing, $56,000. People who have the ability to enroll in workplace retirement plans so that they're saving in 401k plans, putting money into IRAs, 401bs, just a little more than half of people who have access to retirement plans are taking advantage of them. And you've got 47% of baby boomers now considering themselves retired and at the retirement age. Unfortunately, for so many of them, they're carrying debt into retirement. A much higher level of seniors and people in retirement are now saddled with debt that they didn't used to have. 44% of, of people aged 60 to 70 still have a mortgage in retirement. And of that cohort, 62 and above own about $8 trillion of home equity. So that's, that's equity they can tap into, but they're carrying mortgage and debt. That is a challenge as they go into retirement. In fact, over, over the last decade, people 60 plus have seen their debt level increase almost 500% in the last decade. So the average debt now for somebody age 56 to 74, $96,000. And the average debt for somebody age 75 and above, almost $41,000. And it's primarily driven by debt still related to their housing. Many seniors are carrying school loans for themselves or for loved ones. And, and a huge part of debt problem for seniors and people in retirement is medical bills. So that's a real big driver of a problem for people in, in retirement. Just saving enough to live on in the best of times in retirement is very difficult. But when you start to factor in the, the, the impact of health and long-term care costs, it can be devastating to somebody's retirement and could wipe out all their savings in, in a year or two. 70% of people over the age of 69, of 65 are going to need some formal long-term care. The number of people receiving care in this country today, long-term care, home-based care, 12 million people in a skilled nursing facility, 1.3 million people, and in assisted living, over 811,000 people. The average cost for a couple who would retire now as of 2019, starting at age 65, are gonna spend $285,000 on medical and, and, and even higher if it, with long-term care costs in their retirement. So who pays for care? Well, on national averages right now, the cost of care, home-based care is about $5,000 a month, assisted living, $4,500 a month. And for somebody in a skilled nursing facility, in a semi-private room, $7,900 a month. In a private room, $9,000 a month. The primary funding sources for long-term care costs, entitlements, 35% of, of what's spent for long-term care in this country is spent by Medicaid. 25% is spent by Medicare, but that's primarily for short-term rehab stay and stays and for hospice care. On the private pay side, about 4% of care is covered by long-term care insurance. 33% is paid out of pocket. So when it comes to insurance policies, how is this being covered? There's about 7.5 million in-force long-term care insurance policies in the United States today. About 70, about 7% of adults over the age of 50 have a long-term care insurance policy. And there's 255 million life insurance policies in force in this country today. Who's planning for the cost of care? That's the big question. Who's planning for it? And this is a, where there's a real disconnect. There's a ring, you know, this is where you really start to see the myths and the realities come together. You know, 
62% of people surveyed have said if they were impacted by a long-term care event in their life, whether it's for a loved one or themselves, that would prompt them to want to look at buying long-term care insurance. But 64% of people have done little to no planning. 82% of people asked said that if it comes down to it and they need long-term care, they're confident they'll be able to afford it and they'll be able to access the care they want. But 85% of people don't believe they're gonna need long-term care in their future. So a real disconnect, and it's so interesting how close these numbers are to the people who said they would do planning but have done none, and to the people who believe they can take care of care but actually don't believe they're ever gonna need it in their own future. So what do, what do people have to work with? Well, they, we have safety nets like social security. There's 52 million people age 65 and above that are collecting social security. The maximum benefit, if somebody started taking social security at age 62 this year would be $2,364 a month. And the maximum benefit if somebody were to start taking Social Security this year at age 70 is, is almost double that, $4,194 a month. So there's a big difference as to what you're going to get if you start taking Social Security at a younger age, the, at 62, versus at the maximum older age, 70, as to what your benefit difference would be. Because once you start taking your Social Security benefit, you lock that amount in. For the rest of your life. The national average for people collecting social security is $1,500 a month. And trying to live on just that or primarily that is very challenging. And there's also the fact that if you're earning income above $19,560, that can trigger taxes against your social security benefit. So there's some real challenges here around people who are strictly relying on social security or, or the vast majority of their income coming from social security. Also with Medicare, you've got 64 million people, 65 and above they're enrolled. 36 million are in traditional Medicare plans and 23 million are in, in advantage plans. And Medicare can be expensive. There's premiums to pay on part A. There's premiums to pay on part B, which have gone up from last year to this year. And if you enroll in an Advantage plan, depending on what your plan selection is, you're, you have a, a range of premiums you're going to pay. And for your Part D pharmacy coverage, if you're in traditional, uh, there's a range of what that costs you. And if you're an Advantage plan with pharmacy coverage, that's going to impact what your out-of-pocket costs are. So people who think that you know, once you go on Medicare, you're just covered are rudely awakened to find out that there's some real out-of-pocket costs, not just premiums, but deductibles and coinsurance as well. So there's some legislative initiatives that are currently underway that are seeking to address these problems. And let's go through some of those. One, you've got the Social Security Act 2100 that's looking to increase the minimum monthly benefit for low-income retirees. Because that minimum number I just shared with you, that's for somebody who's paid in the maximum amount. There are lower, that's not your minimum, that's your maximum at age 62 or your maximum at age 70. But for a lot of people, they're collecting lower than that. And so for low-income retirees, there's, there's a hope to increase what their monthly benefit could be. And also to revise how the cost of living the COLA formula is calculated to better reflect the realities of, of the cost of living for seniors. There's the WISH Act. That's intended to help more people access long-term care insurance coverage. This would create a new federal long-term care insurance trust fund that's funded by a payroll tax of 0.3% on both workers and employers to get more coverage for people who, as we've seen statistically, are way underestimating the costs and the realities of their need for long-term care in the future. There's the AGE Act to help provide some financial relief to family members who are acting as caregivers for loved ones. And that's a huge part of how long-term care is delivered in this country. It's delivered by family members and loved ones. So a tax credit to, to help those people with, with loss of income and out-of-pocket costs that they're experiencing providing care 
to a loved one. Then there's the SHIPA Act, which would give seniors a new form of long-term care HSA funded through a life settlement. This is uh, another bill pending in Congress. So if somebody were to use a life settlement, the LTC life settlement, to sell off an unneeded life insurance policy, those funds could be placed into an HSA style account known as a senior health planning account that would then be used to cover their future health and long-term care needs. And all the money from that life settlement would be tax-free uh, as long as the money was sitting in the account and then it would be used for care, similar to how an HSA works. There's the SECURE Act and the RISE Act. These are, are, are acts that are very similar kind of, they're looked at as sort of similar uh, sister pieces of legislation intended to provide more incentives and opportunities for Americans to better plan for, for retirement. There would be mandatory uh, automatic enrollment provisions into retirement 401k plans, and there'd be increased tax credits for small business owners to do more to offer re retirement plans to employees. It's all about creating more um, uh, availability and incentive and awareness for workers to get into retirement plans earlier, get their money into tax advantage vehicles, increase the amount of money that could go in uh, uh, based on age and income to better help people prepare for their, their retirement futures. There's also uh, the Medicare Part B premium increase, which was a significant increase from 2021 to 2022, it went from $148.50 to $170.10. And this was driven by the thought that there would be a new Alzheimer's drug that uh, the, this increase would help pay for, which is estimated to be about a $56,000 a year per patient cost that would be, that would be covered by Medicare. Uh, and, and that is an expensive hike for, for many people, particularly in this inflationary environment where people are trying to manage living on a fixed income. So those are legislative initiatives that are, are proposed. They're working their way through Congress, but here's stuff that's happening. Here's legislative action happening now you wanna know about. First, the SECURE Act was passed by the House of Representatives in, in an overwhelming bipartisan vote of 414 to five the SECURE Act has passed the House and is now going to the Senate. So the SECURE Act would automatically enroll employees in a 401k plan, which with an, with an, with an automatic contribution level of 3% minimum to start of their salaries, and that could go up to, and that would go up over time to 10%. But employees can opt out. So you're automatically enrolled, but an employee can opt out. It would also uh, increase the catch-up catch contributions that people can make to IRAs uh, to $10,000 for people at the ages of 62, 63, and 64. So getting more money into those accounts at those critical years right before retirement. It would also uh, extend the age for required minimum distributions. Currently, it's at, set at the age of 72. So anybody who's 72, this year has to start taking required minimum distributions. If this passes, that would actually shift that another year forward to age 73, and then would work its way up over time to actually being a required minimum distribution age of 75 from where it is today at age 72. And would also create a sort of a 401k style employee matching contribution program for people to help pay off student loans, which a lot of people drag student loans well for years into their future and for many even into their retirements. So here's another way to help people take advantage of employer-based pre-tax vehicles to not only save for their future, but pay off uh, student loan debt and, 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 and prevent that from being dragged forward into their future. The Medicare Part B premium increase, CMS, has indicated that that Part B premium increase is going to be eased back, that the, that, that the use of the Alzheimer drug is going to be restricted to beneficiaries that are participating in qualifying clinical trials. So instead of it just being opened up to anybody, 
you're going to have to qualify to be in a clinical trial for that coverage, which will reduce that premium pressure and give Medicare the opportunity to, to actually ease and turn back that premium increase. And CMS's official decision is expected very soon. Uh, LTC life settlements. There's a lot of support for LTC life settlements. The more that people can do to tap into private pay options, into assets they own, uh, the, that is getting a lot of support in Capitol Hill and in the states. The SHIPA Act is live and remains on Capitol Hill as an introduced bill. The NEIC has previ previously has endorsed LTC life settlements and the use of, of a long-term care benefit account, similar to what the SHIPA uh, configuration is. And COIL also has previously endorsed LTC life settlements and funds going into a benefit account. And there's been some interesting research that's come out from prominent insurance industry groups talking about how this merging interests of policy owners, long-term care providers, and governments looking for ways to reduce the need or, or, or at least hold back the need for, for as long as possible, people going on to Medicaid by using a private pay resource such as the LTC Life Settlement dedicated to paying for their care and delaying or even eliminating their need to go on to Medicaid, saving billions of dollars in taxpayer money in the process. The Social Security COLA. Now, in 2022, we saw one of the highest uh, COLA increases in history, 5.9%. But guess what? That didn't keep up with the rate of inflation in 2022. A 5.9% COLA increase has been blunted by the fact that we've got an 8.5% inflation rate right now. And there was a Medicare Part B premium increase that we were just talking about. So right now, projections based on where inflation is is looking at in, for next year, 2023, an increase right now today based on the numbers would be at 8.9%. That would be one of, the, one of the biggest in history. So there is the potential for more relief when it comes to the people who are relying on social security, but that doesn't change the fact that we have some big myths and there are some realities that the numbers just don't lie. You know, we, we, the U.S. is an aging population. The, our life expectancy has been declining for the last two years, and right now uh, measures up at, at as much as five years below our, our peer nations, developed Western nations across the world. And we have very limited financial safety nets. Social Security and Medicare can only carry so much of the burden, and there are costs that come out of pocket such as we, we, we went over in Medicare, that, that those that are on these safety nets have to bear. People are underestimating or not even thinking about the cost of retirement and not adequately preparing through, through savings, investments, insurance. It is, we, are, we are under preparing for the realities of retirement how long, it, how long somebody's going to live in their retirement, how much it's going to cost, and what they need to successfully live in retirement is, is underestimated and not being prepared for correctly. People are carrying way too much debt and, and family-related burdens into their retirement, further draining their ability to sustain a healthy retirement. Social security is not enough to live on alone or even to have it be the majority of what your, your income should be. And Medicare comes with some significant costs. It's not a one-size-fits-all proposition. But there's solutions, and, and, and that's what we've been talking about. Legislative actions increasing to address this growing crisis. There are tax-advantaged retirement savings vehicles that aren't being fully utilized, but with more education and more access, the, you can increase participation, and that comes a lot of that also comes from professionals, advisors, agents to help educate and guide people towards making smart decisions about how they're investing, uh, that they're getting adequate insurance to help cover their risks in the future. And there's also a growth, you're seeing 
continued growing use of alternative financial solutions to specifically designed for seniors. And we've talked about these things like reverse mortgages, life settlements, as ways to leverage assets that are uniquely designed for seniors. You know, the minimum age for a reverse mortgage is 62. Life settlements, typically the minimum age is 65. And, it, it, and these are, are vehicles that are going to do more financially for seniors the older they are, the longer they've owned the home, the less debt they have on a home, the longer they've owned a life insurance policy, the, the, the more uh, impaired their health conditions are. So these are some, some very innovative financial solutions that seniors, baby boomers in particular, as they're aging, have access to. And you, as agents and advisors, are uniquely positioned to be problem solvers. And that's the key here. You don't want to be perceived as selling products. You want to be perceived as a problem solver, as somebody who's, who can give value in your consultation, in your advice, and then lead them to the right solutions to address their goals and their problems. If you're just trying to sell the product of the week, th that's going to be pretty quickly detected by, by your clients. But if you're a problem solver, if you're a value add to solving the equation that they're trying to come up with, how do they put the pieces together to, to meet their financial goals for their, for their retirement planning and also for how many are living in retirement today? There's planning vehicles and there's immediate need vehicles. You have access to all those. You're uniquely positioned to be able to work with families to use them and build real solutions for their needs. So I want to thank you for being on today's session, Myths and Facts About Retirement. Uh, I, get, I offer you a free copy of our Retirement Genius Tip Sheet where we have all this laid out for you uh, in, in a very usable and, and informative format. Just give us a call at 888-627-3735 to get your free copy. Uh, as always, we invite you to, to work with Retirement Genius and, and, and use our information, use our resources, be part of our lead referral system, be part of our, our lead referral team. Uh, so go to the Retirement Genius website, retirementgenius.com. And uh, as an advisor, you want to work with us, you want to get access to tools and, and be part of the system, go to advisors.retirementgenius.com. Don't forget, Visit our, our, our blog, Retirement Genius, on anywhere, uh, like podcasts, anywhere you get your podcasts, Spotify, Google, Apple, you'll find the Retirement Genius podcast there. We're part of the Forbes Books uh, podcast network. Uh, and we invite you to join us, to work with us and access this information. And um, we are very thankful for you joining us today.